Thank you so much for coming. Um, and we really have a distinguished uh, lecture for you today. So I'm glad that so many people have uh, shown up. Um, my name is David Mitchell. I'm the executive director of the Institute on Disabilities here at Temple University. I would like to just point out a couple things to you uh, right from the beginning. If anybody needs open captioning or access to the open captioning, please move over to this side of the room. That's where uh, we're providing it, and uh, feel free to, to do so. Second thing is on your chairs, you'll find a small survey form, and we'd love it if everybody would fill that out at the end of the lecture so that we can get all of your enthusiastic comments about Dr. Wolfensburg's lecture today, uh, which is uh, what I fully anticipate. Um, this series, which we've uh, been running for two years now, and this is the last lecture in uh, this, this academic year's uh, lecture series run, is entitled The Geopolitics of Disability. And our idea in this series was to feature new research coming out of the field regarding people with disabilities, the social predicaments that they find themselves within, and to keep our focus global um, and move back and forth between local contexts and examples, larger global picture of people with disabilities, to start thinking really about people with disabilities as a global population that experiences significant degrees of social marginalization and devaluation, <coughs> to understand how those systems work where that stigma and marginalization comes from, how it's particular with respect to people with disabilities, I think in many uh, cases, and ways to effectively redress that. And really, there's no better speaker to take on that huge mission uh, on our behalf. So uh, I just thank him from the beginning, uh, uh, other than to bring Dr. Wolf Wolfensberger here to speak, who's written on social uh, role valorization, normalization, uh, really he's been such a stalwart in the field uh, and someone who has helped us to push forward a concept of having to need to understand the dynamics of stigma and marginalization, devaluation of people with disabilities, and then even better, how to redress those uh, conditions uh, to one extent or other. And even his, you know, his arguments about social role valorization are, are situated in a kind of neutral scientific framework uh, to be able to assess and diagnose uh, the kind of situations that people with disabilities find themselves within within various social contexts. But that in and of itself seems to me to already be doing something. Um, in other words, we can't effectively come up with interventions and plan more productive and positive ways forward for thinking about people with disabilities, including their perspectives um, in our society, without understanding the nature of why those perspectives are so absent, so neglected, so undervalued. <coughs> um, and my expectation today is that he will come in and illuminate us further um, in these various ways. But I'm going to hand the microphone over to uh, Guy Caruso, He's the director of our Pittsburgh office. He's like one person who extends the institute's reach all the way to the west of the state, <laughs> you know, which is one of the few states where it takes longer than five hours to drive from one end to the other. Um, so in some ways, Pennsylvania really, it should be cut in two or three or something like that. And, uh, but at any rate, let me give the mic to Guy. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Wolfensberger. And uh, let's have a, an enlightening time together. Thank you, David. Well, again, a welcome to Dr. Wolfensberger. Uh, he's here with us today. Uh, I met Wolf back in uh, 1974. I know I don't look that old, but it's back in 1974 as a graduate student. And uh, it was a real uh, awakening to me uh, about the concepts that he shared at that point in time about devaluation and, and deviancy and, and social devaluation. And I must admit, um, um, I wasn't easily convinced until I have an opportunity that Wolf provided me to actually go work in an institution for a while. And all the things he talked about that were so uh, horrible that were happening in the lives of people with disabilities were in fact very true. And uh, it, it just shook my world, changed my perspective, and, and to this day I've been so influenced by Wolf and he's been my mentor and friend uh, over the years. He started back in the early 70s at Syracuse University, the Training Institute for Human Service Planning, Leadership, and Change Agentry. I mean, just that concept of really 
looking at how do you plan for services, how do you uh, provide leadership, develop leadership, as well as really look about change. Because you have to realize back in those days, the institution was a primary model for service for people with disabilities, where they were hidden away in the communities, not seen by anybody. So his movement back then to get people thinking about this was quite a, a shift in the thinking, uh, and not a, not a very welcome shift by many people. And his classic book in 1972, The Principle of Normalization, um, really pushed us all to look at the world in a very different light, uh, and really uh, opened our eyes in many ways to see what was possible in the lives of people with disabilities that hadn't been deemed possible at all by anybody uh, other than parents to a great degree. And parents were very enthused by what Wolf had to share. And in Nebraska, where he worked um, uh, with NCOR, created a whole system of services from, from birth literally to old age that was community-based. Again, a whole perspective that had never been really thought about uh, in society. Um, um, from his, his work on normalization, he also developed an evaluation tool called PASS, Program Analysis of Service Systems, which again l allowed us to use these concepts in a very critical way an eye-opening way, go to services and actually interview people, see what was happening, and start to realize that what's often talked about and said is in fact the realities of what's happening in people's lives. So he really raised my personal consciousness, sometimes very painfully so, because I've worked in human services for many years and had to step back and say, you know what? I'm equally devaluing people. I'm equally doing things that are harmful to people. Even in the name of independence and residential services and all these other things, it just really I think personally helped me step back and many of us in this room to really look at what are we really doing and does it lead to people having the good things in life like anybody else. So there's a book table in the back that I'm sure Wolf will talk about with many, many books. He's um, has written, uh, his, his works have been translated into 11, uh, 11 languages. Um, he's been very prolific around getting the word out over the years. Now from normalization he moved on to what, what David had said was social role valorization which again was looking at a way to help people have valued roles in life like anybody else, not the devalued roles that have historically been so predominant in the institutional models. He also developed citizen advocacy, a concept that really brought people together on a one-to-one -to -one basis, basis, both on an advocacy, uh, helping people do instrumental things in their lives, as well as helping people just to have friends. And many people with disabilities lived in a professional world and never had a relationship with anybody else. So his concept, again, brought people together uh, really as, as friends uh, in a reciprocal basis and citizen advocacy programs exist around the world. Um, he also has pushed us into the, the thinking about um, the horrible things that happen in the lives of people with disabilities. Um, a book of his, The New Genocide of Handicapped and Afflicted People, isn't something folks really are really wanting to read. But if you look at some things that are happening, and you have to realize, a good friend of mine says he has a child with Down syndrome. 90% of babies with Down syndrome are aborted in this country today. 90%. And there's no outrage. There's no even acknowledgement that that happens. But Wolf coined a whole term called death making that takes place in the very services that we do. And I could go on and on. And you can see how impassioned I am by what this gentleman has both taught me and given me the opportunity to see. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome Wolf Wolfenberg. Well, students are usually looking forward to uh, completing their schooling and then going out to do some good in the world. And most are also hoping to get a good paying job and to have a career that will allow them to be, so to speak, uh, well off. Now, those hopes are very natural, but there is something about the kind of paid work that involves service to other human beings who are in need that is very different from any other kind of paid work. Uh, we are going to examine some of these differences and their implications, and I should warn you that some of this is likely to make some of you, some of you uncomfortable and perhaps unhappy. Now, you're probably familiar with the story of the man who was traveling by foot through a mountainous desert when he was attacked by robbers who took everything he had even his clothing, and beat him half to death and left him to die. And a while later, first one traveler and then a second one came by, saw what had happened, and traveled on without helping the man, even though both travelers were religious ministers. 
But they were probably on their way to some important function and didn't want to be late. Now, then a third traveler came by on a donkey. He was a member of a despised religious uh, and ethnic minority, namely the Samaritans. When he saw the wounded man, he was moved to his very inmost being. He had with him some wine and some oil, and he used these to clean up and anoint the man's wounds. And then with great effort, he laid the man on his donkey and walked to the nearest inn where he uh, nursed him, and then next day he paid the innkeeper an appreciable amount of money and said, take care of him until I come back from my journey, and if you spend more than I gave you, I'll pay the difference. <coughs> and because of this uh, good deed uh, to a debilitated stranger, we know this benefactor as the Good Samaritan. Now the story is told to answer two questions. One is, who is my neighbor? And the other one is, whose neighbor am I? Now, relevant to us is that the Samaritan did not run to get the help of a charitable organization or agency or of government, but himself helped the wounded man and using his own wine and oil, lifted the man bodily onto his donkey, delayed his important trip, nursed the man himself, and then gave him of his own money for additional care by the innkeeper, all this with no expectation of being paid in return or even of being thanked by the wounded man who belonged to the valued majority that despised people like him. So that is what personal Samaritanship is all about. Now one awkward thing about one's neighbor is that one often cannot pick uh, him or her uh, one can pick one's neighbor, and uh, instead uh, a person's neighborship is thrust upon one unexpectedly. And the neighbor could be any number of uh, people whom one would not have freely picked to be one's neighbor. All this, uh, both the Samaritan and uh, the wounded man, discovered. Left to themselves, Neither would have picked the other as their favorite neighbor, and not even as their non-favorite neighbor. What also complicates issues of charity, in the sense of love and good Samaritanship to the neighbor, is that people often fail to distinguish justice from charity. And this is why people with a strong sense of justice are often interpreted as altruistic, when in fact, they may be very deficient in personal Samaritanship. So there are people who are involved in all sorts of social justice schemes, maybe even justice for mistreated people halfway across the globe, but who do not practice Samaritanship in their personal lives. Some people have referred to this phenomenon as distance love, or telescopic philanthropy, in contrast to uh, love of the near one, the neighbor. <clears throat> now to help clarify this distinction, let's recall that social justice can be delivered by all sorts of uh, societal structures, by laws, courts, governmental regulations, by the efforts of organized lobbying, and on and on. Private individuals can also practice trustless by not asking, uh, uh, by not taking what, what isn't theirs, by uh, not exploiting their neighbors, by not lying about what somebody has done, and so on. In either case, justice can be practiced in the absence of neighborly love, or even uh, in the absence of close contact uh, with a neighbor. Thus, uh, even personal justice is not the same as personal Samaritanship, where out of deep compassion for the plight of this or that individual in one's life, one engages in acts of mercy to that individual, such as giving or sharing food with the hungry, 
getting some clothes to the ill-clad, maybe even some of one's own clothing, taking in the homeless, tending to a sick person, being company to a lonely person, visiting or even springing an imprisoned person, consoling someone who is in the dumps, or who has lost a loved one, and so on. So a big point is that justice can be practiced cold-bloodedly, without love of neighbor. And in contrast, uh, if personal charity were universally practiced, most of the conditions that call for justice would be greatly lessened, or even disappear. One reason is that people are likely to extend justice to those they love, and uh, even more, <coughs> love will often go far beyond justice in seeking the good of the neighbor. Now, keeping these things in mind, let's now look at some big problems or dilemmas with getting paid to serve upon needy persons. One big dilemma is that so many people who feel specially called to service to neighbor end up as paid employees of formal organizations that identify service to neighbor as their mission. And thereby, they become more like the innkeeper who got paid to nurse the wounded person than the Samaritan who did everything not only unpaid, but at considerable cost to himself. Now, a big problem with organizations whose mission is to tend to the welfare of afflicted people is that they evolve or work under bureaucratic rules that limit the scope of merciful actions their members can take both their, their paid and unpaid uh, members, but especially the paid ones. They evolve rules as to what employees can and cannot do, what uh, they, and what they must do. And above all, uh, these days, the very first thing they do is to make sure that the organization will not be successfully sued. Many people are not even aware that these days, this is the often hidden purpose of the first thing that employees are asked to do when they have their first contact with a client, such as signing release forms. Now one thing I can tell you with near certainty, if you are moved by the plight of one of your clients, to the inmost of your being, as the Good Samaritan was, over time you'll be very likely to come in conflict with your employing agency. And if you persist in putting the interests of your client above that of the agency, you will eventually be extruded from that agency. And we will come back to that. One of the other great moral dilemmas of working in human services for pay, uh, perhaps as a career even, is rarely discussed. It is that the more people suffer and are afflicted and miserable, and the larger the number of thusly miserable and afflicted people there are, the more paid human service workers have to gain, both as individuals as well as collectively. In other words, if the afflictions were less severe or didn't exist at all, most human service workers would have no jobs, no income, no livelihood in human services. People who uh, might have been paid uh, human service workers would then have to pursue a different kind of livelihood. And in some economies, such as ours, uh, that would be a chancy thing. 
In many Western societies, we have seen over recent decades an ever-increasing proportion of the workforce employed in human services. There may be a decline in some uh, human service sectors during the present economic crunch, but even now, we're told that the health service system alone will still needs millions of new workers. It, it may never have enough. The health service system, all by itself, accounts for one-sixth of the American economy and obviously has a big interest in the continuation of unhealthy lifestyles. At uh, one time, most paid service workers were relatively poorly paid. Even into the 1950s, the teacher's salary hardly survived to support a family. But then things changed. Now we find service workers at all pay grades. Many still just barely earn a living, such as attendants in nursing homes and therapy aides, teacher assistants, custodial workers, kitchen helpers, and so on. But there's also a large group that earns enough for a middle class lifestyle. And that includes most of the professional and indirect service workers. Now, some people in human service can now even become outright wealthy. For instance, already by 1978, physicians in private office practice were in the top 1% of earnings in the US population. More recently, administrators of large service organizations and of hospitals, and especially of health insurance firms, may earn several hundred uh, thousand dollars a year, maybe even millions. Uh, our local health insurance giant in Syracuse, New York, called uh, is one of the Blue Cross Blue Shield organizations, uh, paid 62 employees more than $200,000 a year. And the three top ones uh, were above a million the top one getting $2.73 million a year. Even the school superintendents are paid the scandalously high salaries. And ironically, the more money one makes, the less direct contact one is likely to have with afflicted and needy people, or even with any people to serve, even if they're not terribly needy. I said earlier uh, that there's a problem with people making a living of other people's misery, and especially when they become uh, well-to-do thereby. But there's a second aspect to this problem in many uh, service sectors, and that is that a huge proportion of, uh, uh, of service recipients are poor. They always have been poor. And they always will be poor. And even worse, their parents often were poor. And their children are going to be poor as well. And in fact, we're dealing with some families that have been poor for hundreds of years. And not only that, many service recipients are poorly educated, unemployed, even unemployable, they're dependent, they're societally devalued, they live in ghettos or in terribly, terrible public housing conditions, and with little opportunity to be mobile and to seek a better life elsewhere. <coughs> in society, such people have hardly any voice or power, and a lot of bad things get done to them. Plus, they often do a lot of bad things to each other. Also, there's a well-established relationship between poverty and poor health, and therefore also between poverty and shorter life expectancies. We've also found that the minds of many human service workers are so focused on the bodily or mental impairments of their uh, service recipients 
of the clinical diagnoses, the clinical condition uh, that they may have, that they do not give much thought to the fact that they're poor. So what they see is uh, a physically handicapped person, a retarded person, you know, uh, a blind person, a deaf person, and they don't see a poor person. You know, and that's the one thing that all that so many of their clients uh, share, and they're not attuned uh, to what this really means and what it leads to. Yet further, the economic gulf between human service workers in certain sectors and their recipients has been growing bigger. As recently as 1940, physicians on the average did not even earn triple what their patients did. <coughs> Now, the economic gulf means that there is now a big class gulf between many service workers and their recipients, and it may even uh, be uh, uh, as multi-generational as the gulf was between the French nobility and the French proletariat prior to the French Revolution of 1789. The terms exploitation and oppression come to mind. After all, if a lot of people were made and kept poor, how could the rich people be rich? Ask yourself, for where would a financial manager get an annual bonus of $500 million? Where does this money come from? It must come from somebody. And from where would tens of thousands of financial managers get uh, outrageous bonuses? Not to mention just plain incomes. In my opinion, all this contributes, kind of correction, it constitutes a great moral dilemma, even a scandal. And what makes it even yet worse is if the paid workers reject their recipients and dislike them. And does this happen? Absolutely. Uh, some fields are notorious for this. One is aging, as researchers have shown. Another one is psychiatric services where it's common for workers to hold low opinions of their recipients. And similarly, disdain for prisoners is widespread among prison personnel. Now, in my archives, I have several stories of well-paid service workers opposing the location in their neighborhoods of group homes of the very kind, for the very kind of people that they serve, because they don't want those people uh, in their neighborhoods. Aside from the objective hardship of many dependent people, is their subjective misery. Many are abandoned, and they feel this intensely. Many have no one to talk to, no one who consoles them, no one to go to if they need help, no one who look, looks in on them, to see if they're even still alive. And so when they die, it may take days or even weeks to discover. And no one may be at their funeral, or only people who get paid to be there, like maybe the clergy member on retainer to the welfare department who never knew the person. Now, I'm not even done uh, sketching the, uh, the bad things connected to the gulf between workers and recipients. Another one is that the quality of service rendered by the paid service, especially the publicly supported ones, is generally very low. The reasons are actually not as obscure, uh, but overcoming them has been impossible. Here are a few examples. When I came to New York State in 1973, there were nursing scandals left and right, and they have continued to be ever since. You know, every time there's a scandal, there's a sky of reform, and then the next scandal. 
or the non. Despite all their money, the public schools seem incapable of teaching children even basic academic skills, as they once did. They once knew how. They no longer know how. They no longer do it. The single biggest service <coughs> that people with mental troubles get is prescription mind drugging with drugs that have very, very detrimental effects on their bodies and often debilitate their minds even more. Now, interestingly, the reasons for poor service quality have changed uh, drastically, roughly since the uh, early 1970s. Before then, services often uh, uh, were bad because not much money was allocated to them. A good example were the huge, overcrowded, underfunded snake pit institutions. They were the stepchildren of the states. The federal role in service funding was then still in, in its infancy. However, an additional reason is that after about 1970, the economy became increasingly a so-called post-production one in which service jobs replaced <coughs> production jobs. Soon, money started to flow to services in a waterfall and services proliferated, but they also began to become highly bureaucratic and to spend money frivolously and fruitlessly uh, to this day. So at least one of the other major reasons for low service quality now is no mystery. If human services were effective, the entire economy would collapse. You got it? The economies of highly developed countries are no longer based on productivity, such as farming, fishing, mining, construction, and manufacturing, as formerly. But they're based on services. And these economies literally need a large proportion of dependent people so as to create jobs in the human service sector. And not only in direct services, but in the construction of human service facilities, in supplying human services with energy and goods, in cleaning the facilities, providing food to the recipients, and on and on. <coughs> so the truth is that our post-production economy cannot afford to have too many healthy, well-adjusted, functional, productive, and employed people just can't afford them. And therefore, it has to create conditions that in turn create dependency. And hence also, of course, create human service jobs. And it has to operate human services in a way that keeps them relatively <laughs> ineffective. How is this accomplished? Well, uh, by rules, like laws, regulations, <coughs> funding disincentives, and other, all sorts of other uh, strategies uh, that, make it, that make for low service quality and that make for ineffectuality. But all of that, of course, is very disguised and hidden. The facade of benevolence, you see, and behind it, are these uh, uh, systematic disincentives. Now, some services are, services are not only ineffective, they actually do more harm than good. Among these are much of juvenile correction, many services to the elderly, many long-term institutions, and the entire uh, shrinkery section. Now, since all of this is morally despicable, Society hides it well behind the facade of generosity, of service provision and uh, funding, uh, behind noble rhetoric, and, uh, and behind the concealment of the amount of true unemployment. Did you know that the long-term unemployed human service clientele 
is not even included in the official unemployment figures. Thus, when government releases unemployment figures, you have to multiply these by two, by three, by five, or more to get the real figures. Or did you know that on the streets of all of our urban centers, you will see, and you may see every day, some of you, that there are many people who are poor, homeless, rejected, abandoned, wandering, hungry, in very poor health, but they've got a case manager, and they have at least one individual service plan. <laughs> What's wrong with that uh, picture? You know, even people who are not homeless but are living under terrible conditions may get services that are expensive but meaningless, such as case management and individual plans, but still nothing that would lift them out of service dependency. In Syracuse, as elsewhere, various federal, state, and local governments have conspired to build uh, and business have conspired to build one segregated slum public housing project after another. And the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development is the worst. When after barely 30 years of use, such projects are run down and they get abandoned, and that has happened with several of these projects in Syracuse, then they get very expensively torn down and very expensively rebuilt, sometimes in the very same spot. Each separate living unit of these projects is so expensive to build that if residents were given the cash, they could have bought very nice existing housing dispersed throughout the community. Unfortunately, you can do your own math, I'm not kidding you. Unfortunately, good houses in poorer neighborhoods are allowed to deteriorate until they become uninhabitable. <coughs> and then, much more expensive ones <coughs> are often erected in the same spot with public monies or by private non-profit efforts. <coughs> There's a third big problem of paid services. <coughs> In the case of some people, 100% of their lives is spent as recipients of paid services. They live in a service to residence. They spend the, the day uh, in a paid day service or an agency run vocational service. They get taken to recreation events by paid workers and so on. Plus, they may do all of this in the never-ending company of other dependent and devalued service recipients. Now such people may be well taken care of, but there's one thing they lack, and that is freely given relationships. There may not be one single person in their lives who relates to them without getting paid. And imagine what the message of this is to such recipients. You are so different and so despicable that no one will choose you, will want to be with you, be your friend, and so on, unless they get paid for it. And there is the fact that so many lowly service recipients have indeed been abandoned and rejected by just about everybody, including by the service workers who are getting paid to serve them. <coughs> 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 
Now, this is why it's so important to try very hard to assure that people who are deeply embedded in the service system have relationships to people outside the service system. So, on the one hand, there are many afflicted persons who are very much rejected. And yet, on the other hand, the moment people are offered good salaries for entering a human service, then suddenly there are large numbers of them proclaiming to have a vocation to feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, close the naked, console the brokenhearted, bind the wounds of the sick and wounded, and so on. <clears throat> Just where were all these people before they were offered payment to do these things? Could that many people really have had a calling to what they end up doing for pay? After all, in North America alone, there are now about as many people living off human services as they are dependent or afflicted people at any given point in time. It's almost a one-to-one -one ratio now. True, at least some of them were service volunteers before they became employed, uh, human service workers, and others remain voluntary servants even thereafter, but only some of them. <coughs> now sorting out who has a service calling and to what and who does not is of course difficult. In fact, when paid service do what paid service do when their jobs disappear can be a strong retroactive sign whether they had a calling or not. The ones that did will continue to serve as best as they can on an unpaid basis, and the others will disappear from the service scene. There are there are human service workers who perceive the oppressive nature of many services uh, or service practices but fewer who also perceive the exploitative element. And there are close to none who view themselves as among the oppressors and exploiters. <coughs> and quite to the contrary, they see themselves as noble, unselfish, as giving more than they receive, as generous, and most definitely as bringing benefits to the people for whom they work. If they are professionals, they see themselves uh, as deserving both the relatively high social status that they receive and the middle class income that goes with it. But that is not at all the way that their clients are apt to see them, or the way I see them, or necessarily the way it really is. To many clients, the human service worker is the enemy. An example would be the social worker who controls the poor family's income and takes their children away. Another example is the rehab counselor who hardly ever finds jobs for clients, but seems to string them along for years on end. Or the psychologist who gives tests that lack ecological validity or that lead to nothing or the psychiatrist who brings havoc into the lives of patients, often by mindless mind drugging or other poor dispositions. <clears throat> now sadly, it is almost impossible now to get a paid job in human services that does not absolutely require that one engage heavily in absurd and bureaucratic things that at the very least waste one's own time and that of the service recipients, but often also impair service quality. Now let's go back to what we said earlier about a service worker getting into conflict with his or her agency. Imagine that you work for an agency, the real function of which 
in society is to stimulate the economy and to maximize the number of dependent people in society. And you try to liberate people from uh, such an agency and societal dependency. How could you possibly not get into conflict with your employers and avoid extrusion? Today, to serve someone effectively and with high quality almost requires that one do so outside of one's paid job as part of one's way of living and of, you know, uh, and, and unpaid, of course. <coughs> People with more education are more likely to be able to find or create jobs outside the service sector, perhaps, perhaps however, in also in other worthless employment sectors like computerdom. Uh, but that is much less the case with more lowly people who make up a large proportion of the direct service labor force. They're largely stuck in low paid service jobs where they have to follow the instructions of the people from above. There are very few students of practicing human service workers, or all practicing human service workers, who have ever been told of the dilemmas that we've sketched here. Unless they've been taught by members of our teaching culture. And this tells us that there can be such a thing a systemic unconsciousness that can hold an entire field in its grip. There are other examples of this. So for instance, there are several such unconsciousnesses about major issues in the mental field, in vocational rehab, in the mainstream of education, and so on. Now, a lot of you may be ready to shout out, uh, but what is to be done about all this? Now face it, but many of these things, nothing will be done because these things serve too many powerful interests and societal functions. So a much more relevant question is, what am I going to do about all this? And uh, here are a few possibilities. First is to acknowledge the realities that we've spelled out here. Because without a conviction that they're real, one is not likely to be motivated to take any relevant action. Realities that are unpleasant tend to be denied and repressed. The best way to avoid all the problems that come with paid service is to keep people out of service clientage or to get them out uh, if they're already in it. Now, in the vocational sector, this could mean, for instance, trying to find employment for handicapped adults by using informal avenues, like asking family, neighbors, friends, and so on for work opportunities, <coughs> trying to craft individual work niches for <coughs> handicapped persons maybe even of an entrepreneurial nature, and so on. Now, amusingly, uh, people's tendency these days is to instead do just the opposite, namely to get every effort, make every effort to get people enrolled in the service system if they have some kind of a need. A major way of uh, doing number two here is to meet people's needs in informal, unpaid, voluntary ways. As for instance, by what has been called natural supports. There are many forms that this can take. This also implies that if one can afford not to work at all, it would be preferable to serve needy people on an unpaid basis. I've been emphasizing for years that uh, for handicapped people, unpaid work that is contributive 
and it has a valued adult image, may be preferable to paid work that may be segregated, that congregates the valued people together, as is typical in like shuttle work and so on, or that may uh, only be at work for a few hours per week, as is very common in so-called supported employment. And, of course, uh, uh, doing productive, adult image, positively imaged, uh, unpaid work, is better to do no work at all. By any account, by any criterion, And all of that is especially true for handicapped people who receive a government subsidy, as so many do, and uh, who are not dependent on earned income. <coughs> it's also important to assist in sabotage, mindless and futile bureaucracy, bureaucratic rules, as much as one can do in one's paid service. In other words, I'm I'm uh, encouraging you to uh, be in rebellion against your employer, <laughs> in essence. You know, as much sabotage of, of the mindlessness that's going on as you can get away with. Yeah. Uh, another strategy is to do everything one can that's under one's uh, control to keep people out of paid human services who are not having a calling for it and who do it primarily for money. They're more apt uh, to do harm than good. However, <coughs> these days, keeping people who are unsuited as service out of paid service positions as I said, there's a near possibility, impossibility, uh, because um, paid services are available in, in, in the service industry, in service, I shouldn't say industry, in, in services, in uh, vast numbers in the post-production economy. And so people flock to them regardless of their suitability for them. And secondly, uh, it is widely assumed that in order to fill all sorts of human service positions, one does not need skills and qualifications. You can, you can just see that the way people, who gets hired and how they get hired. <coughs> and the people who cannot find a job anywhere else, then go and apply in human services, and they're likely to get one there. And they can't get one anywhere else. To many people, human services is a business, maybe even a business for profit. We have to resist that idea, and uh, any idiom that suggests it, such as referring uh, to service recipients as customers uh, and uh, consumers, any idea that the mission of service is to give recipients what they want, which is often said these days, uh, much like a business would do to keep a customer happy. Human services differ in absolutely essential ways and fundamental ways from purely economic enterprises. In business or industry, one largely treats with objects. And it's quite possible to manufacture objects that one detests and indeed, one can even abuse a great many physical objects if one feels frustrated or resentful toward them. You all know people who go around kicking tires. Now the problem is that when one works with human beings, especially wounded ones, one cannot kick them around. And one can't let one's frustrations and resentments stand between oneself and them. And relatedly, no amount of money can buy positive feelings or commitment from service workers. No one can pay one human being to love another, uh, or in fact it's even somewhat difficult to pay people to hate. One can get people to hate by indoctrinating them ideologically, or feeding them lies. But no amount of money can get a person to like someone whom they don't like. 
Money can only manage to give people a motivation for hiding their feelings. And what it boils down to, in essence, is uh, that a sense of alienation, distanciation, or non-identification with people when it's supposed to serve is one of the biggest contributors to violence and abuse in human services. One can recite many examples of these problems. The current one being the nursing home field, which once again is being treated like a business, where many people are being hired to work with people whom they uh, do not like at all, and where abuses are rampant. Staff turnover, uh, in many, has been 70% uh, a year, 70% a year. At least in part a sign that people are working in this field because it's a livelihood, and not because they feel uh, called to work with elderly people, or because they love them or even like them. So a big point here is that in many ways of serving others in need, in many ways of serving others in need should be viewed as a calling, which can take a lot of forms depending on one's gifts and talents. <coughs> People in paid services are highly advised to engage in what we call validation of their paid work. Namely, uh, by doing certain things that make it clear that one is not in the work primarily for income, prestige, or comfortable lifestyle, and that one is not striving to maximize one's material benefits from one's paid service. And one can think of uh, four forms of, of such validation. One can find a place and a master that allow one to do the right thing and in ways that are consistent with one's calling, even if one has to work at a significantly lower salary. And actually, a lot of called servers do that. In addition to serving for pay, one can also perform unpaid service, and best of all, outside of one's professional or occupational role, maybe in a completely unrelated service role. For instance, a physician could take uh, on a lowly and anonymous role as a server in a soup kitchen for the poor. Or the service administrator could sit uh, through the night by the hospital bed of a debilitated person as an unpaid companion and protector and so on, rather than doing something that just is is what they would do for pay, uh, you know, uh, ordinarily. Outside of one's job, one can enter into so-called life-sharing with needy people by establishing reciprocal and supportive relationships, joining in activities and celebrations together, and so on. And best of all, one does this with people other than the ones one, whom one serves for pay. And such life sharing can take two major forms. One uh, is to enter into the life sphere of needy, the needy person, going to where they are, eating what they eat, living where they live, maybe living with them, being, being treated the way they get treated. And the other one, is bringing the needy person into one's own life sphere. That's by involving them in one's own family activities, bringing them into one's home, and so on. Now, people who are not in paid services may also embrace this strategy in an effort to engage themselves in some kind of voluntary personal helping. Uh, and, of course, there are innumerable examples of people doing exactly uh, these, these things often through uh, you know, the uh, um, natural, informal, unpaid forms of, uh, uh, of serving others. 
And uh, several of these uh, strategies point toward another strategy, namely living in outright voluntary poverty, even while holding a paid service job. And thereby, one uh, not only doesn't get much material benefit from one's paid work, but one also enters into solidarity and life sharing with and into the estate of so many of one's service recipients who I said have always been poor and always will be poor. One can do this either by serving for much lower pay than one, would, one could get, or by willingly giving away uh, a, a good share of, of what one earns. Now imagine if the insurance executive who's paid several millions were to give most of it away, live in a poverty level income, and thereby not be able to afford private health insurance, or uh, not being able to, uh, 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 and thereby having to make do with the same medical care that the poor have access to. Now this of course is different from working in non-voluntary poverty, as many uh, of the lowest paid service, service workers are now doing. You know, the lowest paid, the ones I've talked to earlier, uh, uh, they, they get poverty wages. Now some of these strategies can have the effect that, that uh, one will be badly treated by one's privileged peers or by society generally. They may begin to treat one the way they treat uh, the people one serves, meaning badly, because one is becoming more like these people, at least in their eyes. An example of, you know, is the white freedom riders of the 1960s, who in the U.S. South often got treated like blacks, even got beaten, and in some instances killed. However, being treated the way one's recipients are, uh, are uh, is apt to make for strong identification with them, and hence for more devoted service to them. Interestingly, the three big dilemmas that I sketched have been recognized in certain traditions of religious service. For example, into the Middle Ages in Western Europe, and in some instances even later, huge numbers of people served for free, either as uh, unpaid members of serving orders or of voluntary confraternities, or just as part of their ordinary lives. And it was widely considered to be wrong, even a great sin, to accept money for a charitable work. Midwives especially considered it very sinful to accept payment for their services, and so did many wet nurses. Also, it was customary to treat the people one served with, with great, one served with great deference as if they were uh, the so-called hidden Christ. Servers felt honored and grateful to have that opportunity to serve for free. Commonly, a pilgrim or a sick person or a pauper who sought hospitality in one of the about 100,000 free hospices across Europe would not only be provided with shelter, food, and medical attention, but quite often would also be given clothing or better clothes. And upon departure, might be furnished not only with food for the journey, but also with actual cash in hand. And it was standard practice into the 20th century for physicians to serve the poor for free in hospitals. Many went one step further and gave their poor patients money, recognizing that the poor uh, needed money more than they uh, needed the ministrations of the physician because these ministrations were largely futile in those days anyway. A similar tradition prevailed in the charitable installations of Islam, at least during its more flourishing period. 
Some figures stand out in the history of medicine as selfless and dedicated. Many of them saw themselves called to the tending of the sick the way other people saw themselves called to the ministry or the religious life. They embraced voluntary poverty and sometimes led saintly lives of self-negation and without any thought of personal security. And they risked their lives uh, constantly in those days of contagion and infectious diseases and so on. For example, one famous Quaker physician in London during the late 1700s was John Fothergill, who gave money to his poor patients, often slipping it discreetly into their clothes while examining them. He believed that practicing medicine for the sake of money was a vice comparable to drunkenness. He charged the rich only so that he could serve the poor. He also opposed violence, injustice, and oppression in a larger society. And he was succeeded by another Quaker, John Coakley, who charged the rich fabulous fees in order to support countless charitable causes, and who believed that he could cure poor people more readily by giving them money than via his medical skills. And, and that's a sophistication many physicians have not attained to this day. And William Cullen, who practiced in Edinburgh in the late 1700s, was also, was also very compassionate to the poor. What little money he had, he kept in an unlocked drawer in his office. And when he died penniless, the drawer was empty. Such figures served as shining examples to younger colleagues. Well, at the beginning of this lecture, I told you that you might not like to, to hear some of this. <clears throat> and this is a time when people are very anxious about their economic security. Uh, or if they are in high places, uh, they're very anxious about keeping their ill-gotten gains. <laughs> However, the truth is truth, and it should not be denied because of one's self-interest and passions because it is well known that self-interest and passions are big obstacles to the apprehension of truth. And I therefore hope that you will continue to think deeply and, and open-mindedly about the dilemmas that I have sketched and not repress them or run away from this hard truth. Now, uh, we're going to open the floor for a discussion and uh, if you haven't noticed that we have a book table in the in the back there. <coughs> Questions, anyone? How much of this is a <coughs> as a reflection of a capitalistic system? That's part of the question. But are there societies that have, or countries, social systems that have broken away from, or not engaged in uh, what I guess Farber called a surplus, the need for a surplus population? Well, uh, <clears throat> the Post-production economy has taken hold in uh, many countries of the world, including some that uh, very different political uh, systems and ideologies. But the post-production economy has such strong dynamics that uh, it uh, tends to overwhelm whatever other uh, systems that may have existed uh, before it. And uh, uh, also we have to always keep in mind that there are no perfect systems. You know, that there are only least worst ones. <laughs> that uh, all, all the, the schemes and the systems and the ideologies and, and the plans and, and so on, they're all uh, riddled with, uh, with dysfunctionalities. You know, and uh, people think that they can exchange one dysfunctional system for another one and they find that they've bought a different set of dysfunctionalities. So uh, 
uh, now even uh, it, it is amazing that uh, that even the countries that were until recently third world countries you know are going through the same uh, problem one one exception is that the Chinese uh, have deliberately decided they will not become a service economy. Uh, and, uh, and that's not necessarily going to save them a lot of trouble because they'll have a lot of other tremendous uh, you know, difficulties to, to, to face. But at least they, they have been conscious about what that brings and, uh, and uh, are trying to, to avoid it. Questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on, uh, since we have this dilemma with people getting paid to support individuals with disabilities uh, as far as loving them and really wanting to be with them, what are your thoughts on local government and um, providers uh, not supporting family members who would like to do this work and thus get paid for it, but there's rules and regulations that keep them, that, that there are barriers for them to get paid for this. What, what are your thoughts on that? If I understand you right, the problem is even bigger because the paid service system is, uh, is very much opposed to, uh, uh, to people uh, providing services for free. Uh, There's some facade, of course, you know, the, the hospitals having uh, volunteers and so on, and, but they, they're not really replacing any paid workers. And so there's systematic disincentives against any, any kind of uh, replacement of, uh, of paid service workers with, uh, with paying families or, or even unpaid uh, <coughs> volunteers. Um, and, uh, and we see similar disincentives. So uh, uh, we even say that, that generally, the uh, the less structured and and often the less expensive form of service is disincentive is to be the more expensive one and the more structured one. And this is why uh, um, the nursing home industry has uh, persistently been opposed. Against um, uh, uh, helping people in their own homes, you know, home help services of various kinds, and uh, when when uh, service monies are cut, the home help services are often among the very first to be cut, which means more people get driven into much more expensive nursing homes, and uh, there's there's a, there's a, uh, there's a um, good reason why this is happening, you know. A question over here. Hi. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate it. I have a question. Um, as a service provider, um, that you would have a client who very desperately is feeling devalued and not part of the community, and they really want to get out of it. They have the desire to do it. And you, as a provider, want to do that for them. And give them the value, give them the abilities to make something of themselves and get into the good life. But by doing that, you, as the service provider, know that that person will lose all of their supports, meaning like their medical care and their financial support and things like that. How do you, as a service provider, um, want to help them better their life, but knowing that doing that is going to make it much worse. Oh. Um. <coughs> well, uh, there, there is no doubt that such scenarios exist, but there are ways to get people out of the service system uh, without them losing, you know, all of their um, their supports or their their so-called entitlements and and uh, and and so on. But yes, it is a dilemma, uh, 
and uh, it may even be a hidden disincentive, you know, that, that, to, to prevent such we call liberations. You know. I know that in my individual cases that I personally would strive to assist them to get into where they want to be mm -hmm. and try and find those supplemental systems to allow them to continue to receive what they already mm -hmm. are. Yeah. But I know that in the person that I have in mind specifically, that should they do that, the costs of going into an independent mm -hmm. you know, life is going to be so significant that they themselves, by coming out of it, will not generate enough income. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, it's frustrating. Yeah, that's the reality. And, uh, and uh, the, the other, uh, one more part to that is, if they do get out and uh, manage without those uh, supports and suddenly need them again, exactly. it may take forever for them to reestablish uh, entitlement. Um, what about the health care legislation? How should that look to reverse this um, uh, process of bur bureaucratization that you're talking about? Well, pretty good question, isn't it? For one thing, I don't think any of us really know how this is going to work out. And uh, I would get my hopes up uh, that uh, we will encounter anything other than <coughs> the same dynamics that we're seeing now. different configurations and different sets of incentives and disincentives and, and, and so on, but, uh, uh, but um, that legislation is not going to reverse the, the major dilemmas that I have sketched. Hi, this is from um, Carol Marfizi. She asked, um, how would you suggest getting people who are used to having paid services out of the mentality of being obligated for unpaid assistance slash relationships? Say that again. How would you suggest getting people who are used to having paid services out of the mentality of being obligated for unpaid assistance slash relationships? Guy, can you? I'm a little hard of hearing that you. Yeah. Um, say, say that one more time so we can understand. How would you suggest getting people who are used to having paid services out of the mentality of being obligated for unpaid assistance slash relationships? Feeling of obligation? Yeah. Diane, can you? Yeah. Is, it, is it a, a feeling of obligation toward, yes. the, toward the caregiver well, or the, the service worker? Oh. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, if I understand you right, um, yes, it, we hear that all the time, uh, that uh, if one is dependent on other people taking care of one, mm -hmm. that uh, one uh, uh, feels that one is obligated, yeah. you know, to them, and uh, and it's a, a two-edged sword, a two-edged thing, you know. On the one hand, it's it's real. Uh, it would be more real if the helper were unpaid, yeah. you know, than if the helper is paid. Uh, then one then one would be even more, you know, an obligated. And the other side of the coin is that. There has been a mentality of uh, an unhealthy uh, yeah. entitlement mentality uh, that if a service is paid, one uh, should not uh, uh, feel, you have to feel grateful for it. You know, uh, this is a, a lawful entitlement and so on. And that's a little bit unnatural, 
uh, and against human nature, uh, in, in my opinion. I think it's, uh, it is appropriate that if someone helps one, and especially if the helping is uh, not a, a completely impersonal thing done only for money, you know, that one be grateful uh, that someone is, is willing to do that and can uh, do that and that one, uh, you know, expresses and uh, feels at least one's, one's gratitude uh, uh, toward them. Uh, I can tell you that when I was in the hospital recently, uh, I was just filled with gratitude to, uh, for the fact that uh, my nurses, who so paid the work, were the soul of kindness to me. Yeah. You know? I said, oh my gosh, what would happen to me if, if they did not have their hearts full of love? You know? It would be awful. One more question, anyone? Yes. Um, I agree with everything that you're saying, but um, I wonder if there isn't a kind of level of expertise that we have developed as being part of the system. And to not have a system with those professionals wouldn't people be lacking for skilled help that they might need to have more productive lives or happier lives? Well, um, well, you may know that, that this is very debated, you know, uh, and uh, uh, and there's much argument that um, uh, that this higher level of in essence amounts to technologization and so on, uh, can, need, can be counterproductive. You know, Ivan Illich's work, for instance, uh, uh, speaks uh, to that. And, um, and there's also much argument about uh, to what degree uh, the higher level of uh, technology in, in things like healthcare has contributed to longevity. A lot of people who say that it's changes in, in uh, life conditions that have increased longevity rather than improvement in, improvements in, in the uh, medical uh, care. You know? So it's, it's, it's controverted. Oh, good. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Wolfsberger for being here today. Can I get one more question back there? Or you want to grab the, take one more since we got it? Uh, you, you said that uh, you came to this country in 1973, and um, I was just wondering what your observations are of the differences in our country now from 1973. Well, the, the early 70s, late 60s, were a watershed. Uh, in many ways, and, and the, but one I emphasized was that's when the economy tipped over uh, from a production-oriented one to um, a post-production-oriented one, and uh, um, and that changed changed everything. What about all these uh, these things that I talked about? Uh, 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 and um, and uh, it's very debatable, you know. Uh, uh, and it is it is debated, you know, what uh, uh, whether people really are, so to speak, um, leading more felicitous lives, uh, whether they're really better off, whether they're really happier. Uh, than they were uh, in, a, in a different, more production-oriented and simpler uh, society than the, than the current one. And in fact, uh, in other contexts, we, we say a great deal about uh, the, the current modernistic society actually heading toward uh, collapse, uh, massive collapse, unimaginably uh, 
catastrophic collapses. <coughs> Okay, nice round of applause for Wolf. And, uh, thank you so much. Okay, the, the, there is a book table in the back that has a lot of Wolf's work on it that you're welcome to go to. Also, please fill out your evaluation forms. You can just leave them at the end of your chairs if you would. Would you appreciate that? Also, the Institute in the back, uh, there's some other books. Uh, we have a couple of events coming on on June 2nd. There's a Beyond Inclusion, Improving Outcomes for Students with Disabilities. If you're interested, you can grab a flyer. There's also a flyer for our Summer Institute going July 26th through July 30th. Uh, Beyond Inclusion, Tools and Strategies for Including Diverse Learners, okay? So again, at both tables in the back of the room, there's lots of materials to, to look at. So again, thank you very much, Dr. Wolfensberg. <laughs>